All right, guys, welcome. Um, we are now ready to move into this next chapter of online learning. So let's see how this goes. So what I'm going to do for you today is um, I'm going to present the next thing that we would have talked about in class, which is the Industrial Revolution. So I've created um, a lecture here, and there's a few focus activities that I'd like you to do while you are watching um, this lecture. So you'll notice on the screen here, and I'm going to post the lecture itself in Google Classroom so that you have access to it, but you'll notice on the screen here that we have the image of the Google Doc. So if you click on that image, it's going to take you to this document here. And um, in this document, this is where I would like for you to take your notes and kind of um, follow along with what I'm talking to you about today in regards to the Industrial Revolution and at the end um, answer the questions that we have here on the page. Um, and there's also a research activity that I'll talk about in a moment. But the directions tell you that because this is a document that you only have access to view, you need to make a copy of it. So um, after you have clicked on the icon for Google Docs to bring you to, sorry, not this, <clears throat> this um, document, the directions tell you how to exactly make a copy if that's not something you've ever done before. So you're going to go to File, which is up here, File, and you're going to click on Make a Copy. And then you'll make a copy of it, and where it says a uh, copy of your name, you're going to delete just that section and type your first and last name. Okay, uh, now I'm going to hit cancel because, and you don't have to worry about any of this stuff here or what folder it's in, but I'm going to hit cancel for right now because I don't want to make any changes to this document. Just make sure that you click first and last name and click OK. So when you're done with this activity, after you've watched the lecture and you've completed the questions and the research activity, you're going to go to Google Classroom for this assignment, and you're going to upload um, this document here and turn it in. So we'll talk about that again later as a reminder. So we have some lesson questions here that I want you to think about while I'm talking to you today about the Industrial Revolution. Um, what I'd like you to do right now is pause the video and read the questions to yourself. I don't want to go through them um, right now, but pause the video, read the questions to yourself so that you know what you are supposed to be looking for while I'm going through the lecture. Okay, so I'm going to look, talk now about the research activity that's down at the bottom. So during this lesson lecture, what I'm going to be talking about is some of the inventions um, that are, came about from the Industrial Revolution. So we have those inventions that I will be discussing listed here. Your task today is to, or this week, is to choose one of the inventions that's listed here um, that I will be discussing very briefly in my lecture. <clears throat> choose one of these that is listed here to learn more about. So in the chart below where it says my invention, you're going to tell me which of the nine that are above here that you have decided to research more. So I'd look into each of them just a little bit more before you make that decision. So you're going to type the name of the invention in this space here. And then here is what I would like for you to look for. So who invented this new technology? How did it work? Uh, what problem did it attempt to solve? And how did it change America? What impact did it have on America? So in this middle column, you're going to tell me your research findings. So use the internet. You should have your Chromebook from school, uh, research whichever invention you chose to research more, and then what you find as the answers to these questions, you'll type in this center column here. And then in the third column, I want you to make sure that you cite your sources. It is important to tell me where you get your information, so you'll, you'll cite your sources here. Okay, so again, for the research activity, step number one is to choose which invention you are going to be um, looking into more, take your notes down at the bottom, and then the final step is to create for me a presentation about that invention that you'll um, share on Flipgrid. Okay, so on Flipgrid you're going to tell me what you found 
about the invention that you chose and the, how you answered these questions here. Okay. So, and if you have, if you have questions about any of this, you can ask me through Google Classroom um, or through School Loop. Uh, you can email me on there and then I'll answer any questions that you might have to the best of my ability. Okay. So again, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through the lecture and what um, I would like for you to do is to be thinking about these questions. Again, if you haven't read through them, pause the video, read through them so that you have an understanding of what you should be looking for as I'm talking to you today. And then at the end, you'll come back here and answer those questions. Now there's also something else, I can't really see it because my little screen is in the way, but um, there's a little uh, picture of some textbooks here. Okay, if you click on that, it's gonna take you to, move myself again, it's gonna take you to the textbook version of what I'm telling you about today. Now there is some extra information that I've added from my own research, but the bulk of what I'm talking about today does come from your textbook. Um, some of you I know have lost the textbook or you just don't want to use it or whatever. You've put it aside, let it collect dust, and that's fine. But for those of you who would prefer to review the information um, without watching the video, the textbook is here for you to use as well. Okay, so those are the resources that I've provided for you to kind of help you with what we're talking about today. All right, so let's get into it here. All right, so we're talking today about um, early industry in the United States after the War of 1812 and some of the inventions that came about during this time period. So again, you'll be taking notes. Make sure you keep track of the inventions that I've mentioned and the impact that they had on America. And then we have our lesson questions here. And again, I'm not gonna go through these questions. You have copies of them in the document. Um, so make sure that you're kind of trying to answer them as you are moving along, okay? So some key vocabulary for this unit. Uh, we have obviously the Industrial Revolution and this um, was started in 18th century Britain and moved its way into America after 1812. Um, and this is when factory machines started to replace hand tools and manufacturing, so mass production of goods, replaced farming as the main form of work. We have the factory system, um, which again is a method of production that brought many workers and machines together into one building. And we'll talk more about that. We have Lowell Mills, which is a textile mill, so like cloth. A textile mill located in the factory town of Lowell, Massachusetts, and was founded in 1828. We have interchangeable parts, and this is when one part is exactly like another part, making it easier to replace. Uh, we're going to learn about Samuel Slater, who is kind of the father of the American uh, Revolution. Robert Fulton, who invented a steamboat. Samuel Morse, who invented the telegraph and Morse code, and let's get into it, okay? So the main idea of what we're talking about today is that new machines and factories changed the way people lived and worked in the late 1700s and early 1800s. So prior to the um, War of 1812, we were a farming community. That's what most people did and anything that they needed, they made for themselves. So people had multiple jobs under one roof to try and sustain life, okay? The, in, the <clears throat> Industrial Revolution changed that. So why does it matter now? Well, these industrial developments that began more than 200 years ago, these continue today. There's this constant process of trying to improve on what was already done to make life easier. So it all began in Great Britain in 1750 so they had their own industrial revolution and some of those ideas were brought to america by inventors and businessmen and manufacturers who came here to settle in the new land now as i'm going through this you're going to see these little popcorn boxes when you get the lecture yourself if you want to learn more about any of these things that i'm talking about you can click on one of the popcorn boxes and it's going to lead you to a youtube video about the topic. 
So before the Industrial Revolution, like I told you, it was a farming based community. Almost 86% of the worker, the workforce was involved in farming in some kind of way. Um, <clears throat> then we have the War of 1812, and the War of 1812 is basically what changes everything, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, 1820 to 1860 was this 40 years of just change. And that's like really the only way to put it. It was change in America. So we shifted from being an agrarian or a farming community to factory or wage labor, where you were farming not only to get goods for yourself, but also to sell to others. Now, most of what you did was work in a factory where you earned a wage for the work that you produced. Also during this time, this 40 year period, the number of states we had went from 16 to 36. So that's more than double the number of states in the United States. And our population went from 5 million to 30 million. And that's a huge jump in a short time period. And a lot of that is because, which we won't discuss today, but there were innovations or new inventions or new ideas in the area of like medicine, or we were learning how to do things to make food last longer. So because we're doing things to help ourselves be healthier and to get over sicknesses and also, you know, anything to help us sustain a longer life, the population is going to get bigger. So early in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of those ideas I talked about <laughs> came from Britain. So this is an idea, this Industrial Revolution is an idea that was brought to us from um, Britain. One of those people was Samuel Slater. And because he was British um, and he brought his ideas to America and he really um, uh, <clears throat> prospered here, people called him Slater the Traitor. And we'll talk more about him later. Um, also, a lot of factories depended on water for power um, or coal, which later became a new source of fuel. And as we're watching this, any place where you see it yellow like this, if you could click on it, it will take you to a document to read more about that. Women made up the majority of the labor force during this time, 80%. And factories owner, factory owners invested in machines that could be operated by untrained workers. So they were easy to operate, and so you didn't need a skilled workforce to operate them. <clears throat> Manufacturing itself, though, is time sensitive. So you have to produce a certain number of goods in a certain amount of time, and that's going to require a certain amount of discipline for your workforce. So even though these people were not exactly trained, they were expected to follow certain guidelines and certain rules so that things could happen in a timely manner. So obviously it was not fun working during the Industrial Revolution. There were long hours. You had little benefits to working in a factory. Um, there wasn't much job security, which means you could lose your job at any time for any reason. Uh, if you died or got sick, too bad for you. It just happened and that's it, you know? <clears throat> and there were no child labor restrictions, which is gonna be huge because not only was the workforce made up of women, but eventually over time, it's also gonna be made up of children for multiple reasons. First of all, they're cheap labor. They'll listen to the people who are in charge and they're small so they can get their hands and their bodies inside of the machines to fix them easier, which as you can imagine is also going to lead to injury and death for young children. So a lot of America during this time, American citizens were anti industrialization, like they did not want this to happen. They enjoyed being a farming community. It was an easier way of life for them, for some of them. But then the War of 1812 came and particularly the naval blockade. So you should remember from the War of 1812 that with a naval blockade, goods could not come into the United States. And because they couldn't come into the United States, 
Americans were forced to make their own goods. So these things that they were getting from France, from Britain, from other European countries, they couldn't come in after the War of 1812. So that gave us no choice but to figure out how to get them another way. The best way to get them another way is to make it yourself. So we have our cottage in industri industry on one side, right, where your work is done at home, it's done on a farm, the women are spinning the thread, and the thread is woven into a cloth. So that's cottage in industry, right? That's how America was when it started. <clears throat> but now we're moving into the factory system. So we have these large machines, a spinning jenny and a power loom, which are going to make it more than just one woman at a time could work on one piece of cloth at a time, she could you or she could um, utilize multiple um, <clears throat> strands of thread to make a larger piece of cloth, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Unskilled workers could do this. Like I said, it was very easy to work these machines. So you didn't have to be educated to work them. Uh, child workers we talked about, and then water was the main power source for a long period of time. So this encouraged people to move from their farms where work was done at home into the cities. So this is going to lead to the growth of cities. This is huge, right? Not, no longer are people living on their farm, isolated on their farm where their neighbor is one, two miles away from them. Now they're moving into a city where your neighbor is like right there. So because of the War of 1812 and the fact that now America had to focus on how it was going to make these products that it couldn't make, it couldn't get imported from other countries, investors stopped spending their money on shipping and trade. Why should you? There's a naval blockade. You can't get in, right? So instead, they invested in these new American industries and businessmen who were spending their money maybe on on uh, factories overseas are now building their own factories here in the United States. And again, because it was a water source, sorry, because water was a source of power, you had these um, factories being built next to rivers. Um, transportation was very um, readily available in New England in terms of ship and ocean access because New England is on the water side. So you could transport goods out of New England because remember, with a naval blockade, goods couldn't come in, but goods could leave. Okay. Also, New England had what I'll call in quotes, a willing labor force. I think for a lot of them, they didn't really have much of a choice. They were kind of pushed out and they had to go into this new industry of factory work. Um, but also too, there were some families who were ready for a change. So there was this willing labor force in New England that allowed for factory the fast, factory system to grow. So here we have two images of what a spinning jenny and a power loom looked like. So a spinning jenny, as you can see on the left-hand side here, She's working multiple threads. Um, <clears throat> you can see them down here, multiple threads for one big loom, right? And then, oh, go back. The power loom, same idea, where we have multiple threads together to make one large loom. So here we have some examples of New England factories. You can see they're built on water because water was their power source. And this kind of gives you an idea of what it looked like on the inside. So Samuel Slater, or Slater the Trader, um, in 1790, he built the very first spinning mill in Rhode Island. Uh, he employed mostly children. Uh, it had eight kids between the ages of seven, 12, seven to 12, and they were paid very, very little, right? They're kids, you don't have to pay them a lot. Um, later on, Slater would move to build larger mills that would employ an, a whole family. So mom, dad, and children are all working um, in the same large mill. And this idea of the family system of employment where the whole family works for the same manufacturer moves from Rhode Island to Connecticut to Massachusetts. So it expands. 
<clears throat> another um, key player in the textile industry is Francis Lowell. And in 1813, he built his mill in Eastern Massachusetts. Um, at his mill, and we can see a picture of it here, you can see that uh, quick moving water that was used to power the mill. Um, it turned raw cotton into yarn and cloth on those power looms. And in 1826, he built a town called Lowell where the mill was the main focus, but it was its own town surrounding it. Um, the girls that worked there were called Lowell girls. They were farm girls who lived in Lowell um, in boarding houses that were owned by that textile company. Uh, they worked 12 and a half hour days. They had what we would call high wages, which were two to four dollars a week. And they had older women who would supervise the young girls with strict rules, including having to go to church all the time. Um, and women didn't work in the Lowell Mill very long. They just worked until they were married and then they left. So the difference really between, and this is one of your questions, between Slater and Lowell is that Lowell really did focus on using um, women as his workforce, whereas Slater worked a lot with children and whole families, right? And their um, standards within the uh, factory were a little different in terms of how much they were paid and how they were treated. You can see the Lowell girls, they had to follow these strict rules and there was someone there watching them all the time to make sure that they followed them. And they also lived within the community in a house that was owned by uh, the Lowell factory. So there were some differences between the two. So in the 1830s, we're going to see a fall in profits um, for the te textile industry. So wages are going to drop and the conditions are going to get worse for the people that work there, particularly the Lowell girls. Um, that idea of using water to power the fa factory is going to shift to steam, particularly coal and wood. Um, and this is going to allow people to now go back to moving away from the rivers. So settling and building cities in places where water isn't necessarily a need as much as it used to be in the New England territories. So Eli Whitney, um, a lot of you might know who he is. He was the inventor of the cotton gin. Um, and in 1947, he was hired by the United States government to make muskets for the army. And he kind of put on a dog and pony show for them and convinced them that he could do it in a certain amount of time. Um, but he really couldn't. So this forced him um, to try to come up with an idea on how to actually meet that need that he had promised. So previously, you had to match the parts um, and each part had to be made individually. So one gun had its parts made individually, and then the, that gun was put to the side, and then a whole brand new gun was made again, right? So what he came up with was, was this idea of interchangeable parts. Um, and for interchangeable parts, one part can be made to fit many different guns, right? So the musket had one part, um, let's say, uh, whatever this part of here is, number 15. Well, that number 15 can be the same for all of the muskets. You don't have to make one specific 15 for this and then a special 15 for this. You could like make a bunch of them the same and they're all going to fit in a different gun, if that makes sense. So it would speed up production. It made repairs super easy. So if you break number 15, then you just pull another number 15 out of the bin and pop it into that same gun, right? Which you couldn't do before. Before, if number 15, that part number 15 broke in your gun, and I'm referring to this right here just as an example. If part number 15 broke in your gun, then you had to throw the whole gun out, right? So this made it different, made repairs easy. Um, it allowed for lower paid, less skilled workers right? <clears throat> so it makes it easier. It also means you, again, don't have to have somebody who's specific to being um, a gunsmith or whatever. You could have Joe Schmo from the farm 
come in and start making guns. Um, but it did require supervision to make sure that every single part was made exactly the same. Um, and that would upset workers because they didn't like this idea of having somebody on their back watching them all the time. So some of those new inventions um, outside of just interchangeable parts um, that helped increase factory production also improved transportation and communication. So we have the steamboat here. And then we have the telegraph and then um, the threshing machine and the mechanical reaper. <clears throat> so Robert Fulton was somebody who uh, invented the steamboat. And the steamboat was great during this time because it carried people and goods farther, which helps lead to cities growing bigger, right? Because you can now move someplace else and settle there. And so cities are going to grow. <clears throat> so uh, Fulton built a steamboat that can move against the current. Sorry, guys. That can move against the current or a strong wind. Um, whereas Henry Miller, <clears throat> he designed an, an engine that could be installed on a double decker boat. So the steamboat was really more that Fulton um, invented. It was really more for carrying goods. And then Henry Miller Shreve's. Um, double-decker boat was more for carrying people, right? Um, so he put that boat on 1816 on the Mississippi River, and this allowed for this whole new era of trade and transportation. And then finally, we have Samuel Morse, not finally, but almost done, who um, demonstrated the telegraph for the first time, which allowed for messages to be delivered in seconds and also help to create Morse code. So this is gonna help with um, both these two ideas, the telegraph and the steamboat, are going to build this sense of national unity because people can come together, they can travel to new cities and help grow new cities. Um, they can speak to people from different eras using the telegraph. So it really helped to bring people together rather than everything being separated, right? So like before the telegraph, you know, you either had to walk your stuff, like your letters or whatever, to whoever you were sending them to, or you had to use um, the horse and buggy method to get a letter or to communicate with somebody who lived outside of your city. Whereas now with the telegraph, it's quickly, it's in seconds. Your communication is super fast. And as far as the steamboat goes, you know, before the steamboat, people who traveled um, along the Mississippi River to give, to uh, take goods to where they were going to sell them, <coughs> excuse me, they would build these, these large rafts. They would put the goods on it. They would sail down the Mississippi, but then the raft couldn't go back up the current. So they basically sold off this wooden raft for um, like firewood or whatever for scrap. And then they had to walk the 18, 800 miles back up the Mississippi River and do it all over again. Whereas with the steamboat, you could load up the steamboat with far more goods, also people, travel them down the Mississippi River, and then turn back around, take goods and people back up the Mississippi River rather than people having to walk the distance back. So it definitely brought people together during this time and created a real sense of unity. Um, and not all changes were in the factory system. We also had some changes to farming during the American or the Industrial Revolution. So John Deere, which some of you may know have seen like the green with the yellow deer. That's John Deere, who's actually a real person. Um, he create, he invented the steel plow. And this was this new plow that helped prep the ground for farmers. Prior to that, um, the wood, the ground would stick to their um, plow and they'd have to scrape it off. But with the steel plow, it just came off easily. So it helped farming quicker, quite a lot less work. And it also encouraged people to move to the Midwest because the steel plow could work in that earth on the Midwest that prior technology, prior plows that they were trying to use couldn't get through. We also have the mechanical reaper. 
and the threshing machine, which were both ways to um, improve the farming industry. So um, <clears throat> that's it <laughs> for um, the Industrial Revolution. What I want you to do at this point is to go back. You don't have to re-listen to this whole lecture again, but you will have um, access to the slideshow itself. Uh, so that you can answer the questions and then complete the research activity that's down at the bottom here. You can also, if you'd like, use the textbook to go back, sorry, use the textbook to go back and um, find the answers if you prefer to look for them. So again, both of those things can be found on slide number two. Uh, you should have already Download the, the, the document, but if you haven't, you can use this icon here to do that. If you want to access the textbook, that would be this icon here. Okay. And again, just a reminder that, um, <clears throat> what was I going to remind you of? I totally forgot. Brain fade. So nothing's different from when I'm in the classroom. When this is all done, um, this document itself, you're going to turn in on Google Classroom. And then down at the bottom, when you are presenting your research findings to me about your invention, you're going to use Flipgrid. And I will post the link to the Flipgrid on Google Classroom with the rest of this stuff. So if you guys have any questions, please email me on School Loop, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, if you have any questions that are not about this, I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. Other than that, you guys, we'll talk soon.